That worked. <laughs> All right. Hi. My name is Eric Molly, and I am the publicity producer of Premiere. It's a lot of peace. Uh, and I have, as advertised, lots of free stuff to give away. I have an excess of free things to give to people just for being here. Uh, the first part of this is the... I, I went through and on 10 of the programs, there is a question, a silver question mark yeah. after the words, the Fufara on the cover. Yeah. If you have that, please uh, present yourself with your mono. We so you have one, two, three, four, five, six. By the looks of things, that means a couple extras. So uh, I know how I'm going to do this. Uh, but raise your hands again so that I know where you are. Do you want a retros or aromas? Aromas? What are they? They are five dollar gift certificates. They are like three five dollars. Wow. And aromas gave me eight of them. So it's a coffee shop. A really nice coffee shop. A little bit of narration. Okay, so question marks? Yes? What would you like? Aromas? There we go. Who else raised their hand? Me, Eric, over here. Aromas or retros? Retros, death. There we go. He will appreciate between one and ten. Oh my God. <laughs> the first person to yell out that number. Who said three? Singleton Copley, and uh, then the play you're about to see was based on the poem that was based on the painting. So I hope you enjoy it. I'd like to thank my wonderful cast and crew, especially my director, Elizabeth Tate. I am speaking in her stead, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to stand before you all. I, uh, I do hope you enjoy the play. I'd also like to thank Professor Rob Ruffin, because uh, I wrote it in his playwriting class. And uh, Final shout out to Jonathan Singleton Copley, without whom it would not be like it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so enjoy, everybody. Have a great, uh, great last show for you. Until, well, 
<laughs> no, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you all are aware the midterm is for another three weeks, correct? Mm -hmm. Are you sure you wouldn't like to come back later? Oh, very well. <coughs> but let me tell you, all of your, you crammed in here into my office like this won't help me get your papers back to you any faster. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, just how long have you all been sitting here? I see. Then you must have been wondering what all the muttering was about. <laughs> and the mirror. <laughs> and the, not that I should even be sharing this with students, but it's really got my knickers in a twist. <laughs> <laughs> you all are aware of the new dean, Dean Chapel. Yes, well, Miss Dean Chapel has come in, barged in to her new office, office. And already she's making a mess of changes. Says she prides herself on running a tight ship. Once professionalism. And today I find out she's instituting a new dress code for staff. To cut a long story short, she has specifically reprimanded me for being in violation of said dress code and insists I must shave my mustache. Mm. The nerve! <laughs> <laughs> now some of you may think it is silly to fume so about something so trivial as a mustache. But let me explain. <laughs> there are many ways to be a man. <laughs> Some men play football. Other men go deep sea fishing or big game hunting. Why the caber tossers of Ireland throw entire trees around for sport. <laughs> there comes a time when every human being of the male persuasion must do that little something extra to separate the average workaday guy from the virile, mythic, earth-shaking man with him! <laughs> now, as you may be able to tell from my, um, academic physique, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much in the way of caber tosser, or master angler, or sports sporto sports guy. <laughs> But even the readiest, tweetiest of professors needs to have a way of letting the inner man out. And I, for one, have always grown my inner man out. <laughs> right here on my upper lip. <laughs> hmm. I see some of you are not convinced. But I don't suppose many of you have heard tell of the uh, great mustache war. No. I expect as much. The state of higher education these days, I'm afraid the subject is lost <coughs> over with abhorrent frequency. Here we are. <laughs> Perhaps this will help you appreciate my plight. Yes, I think you shall soon see why I put so much stock in my stash. <laughs> the great mustache war was a sordid affair, fought for the right to grow sweet facial hair. And yet there are those who've forgotten the clash between faces clean-shaven and those with a stash. The army in red had said, in with the new, which put them at odds with the army in blue. The blues leader, it said, was a little bit strange. He worshipped tradition and dreaded all change. Schnurbart was his name, and he stood against the tide. You can't stop time's march, but he's one man who tried. How this great war arose between, between the red and the blue is a sorrowful. Now I'll tell it to you. I know that my office might not seem like more than a place for mere study. In short, a big bore. But oh, for a muse who might show you the way things went down long ago in that land far away. Between desk and bookshelf, two armies will meet. One of mustache bereft, one of mustache replete. And a world may unfold as my story is read. Hair will grow, war will wage, blood will sadly be shed. And as you look on at Schnurbart and his plight, You'll soon see why I cling to my mustache so tight. In the land of Trichosia, the Schnurbarts did dwell. <coughs> but I must say, on this day, things weren't going well. The blue army, it seems, was mostly for show. Best suited to march in parades, grand and slow. But a mighty and militant force they did lack, which proved inconvenient when under attack. So over the border, the Red Army came, and with little resistance, Trichosia did claim. Now, a soldier awaited outside Schnurbart's door with news of the changes the Reds had in store. Mommy, what's keeping Father? 
Father. It's all right, dear. Father's having a very important conversation, so we mustn't interrupt him. Is Father in trouble? No, not exactly. But you know how stubborn he can be. Now with all these new changes, these new regulations, it's been hard for him. I am sorry, sir, but I cannot abide these changes. <laughs> <laughs> I am afraid these newest ordinances are non-negotiable. I trust you would therefore comply with them. Is that so? And what if I won't? <laughs> but where are my manners? I haven't introduced my family yet. This is my wife, Sarah, and our daughter, Emily. Yes, we have mention of them in our records. <laughs> I have to wonder, sir, why you do not remove your hat inside my home in the presence of two ladies. Mr. Schnurbert, you are out of order. We have alopecia no longer adhere to such outdated customs. Chivalry has a little practical value in the modern world. You had best take this to heart. For once the annexation is complete, you all will be citizens of alopecia. <laughs> what is it? What do they want? It is a simple matter of hygiene. It is your husband's mustache, you see. It is in violation of Ordinance 7G, which states that henceforth all Tricogian men must henceforth go clean shaven, in order to bring your country up to modern aesthetic standards exhibited by alopecia soldiers, <laughs> such as myself. So if we are cleaner, more sophisticated, your husband's mustachioed look is antiquated, or barren. Got it, Missy? How dare you speak that way about my mustache? <laughs> <laughs> and to my wife. <laughs> it is not as though these changes are unprecedented. Depilation has been the hallmark of a march toward a modern world for many years. Decades ago, Tsar Peter I mandated that Russians, <coughs> Russians shave their beards to emulate the fashions of Western Europe. While our movement even has roots in antiquity, Alexander the Great forbade his soldiers from growing facial hair, for there is no better handle to grasp man in combat than by the beard. <laughs> I disagree. Yeah! Oh. <laughs> Leave now. <laughs> and tell your superior that Hector Schnerbat will not be adhering to our latest mandate. I will stand staunchly in my place, as will my mustache on my face. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. Who knows what they'll do next? I don't care what they do next. Already they've overstepped the bounds of reason, asking me to shave. Well, uh, are you going to do it? Of course not. It is not the Tricosian way. After all, my father had a mustache, and his father before him, and his father. And so on in that fashion, dating back to the beginnings of our nation's recorded history. Our traditions are a chain which unite and strengthen us. I will not break that chain. As long as I live, I will not see it broken. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a little overdramatic? <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, if your life were in danger, if, if our lives were in danger, you wouldn't really place first priority on your mustache. Sarah, it's the principle of the thing. You <laughs> <laughs> love my mustache, don't you? Hey, Emily, don't you love Daddy's mustache? <laughs> and you, Sarah? Well, uh, surely it cannot be another red soldier. <sighs> <laughs> ah, Herschel, my good friend. You can see a friendly face in these troubled times. <laughs> Who was he? What did he want, the man in the red coat? He was an alopecian, a scout for the Red Army. And what news did he bring? The alopecians have issued an edict. Every upper lip in Tricosia is to be completely and thoroughly depilated post haste. In short, there are to be no more mustaches. <laughs> Just as I feared! Curse those baby face mad children! <laughs> 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 Hector, I have some rather urgent business to discuss with you in private. Uh, my apologies for asking you, ladies, but what I have to say is of grave importance and requires great secrecy. Of course. Don't you do anything dangerous now. Don't forget that we love you and need you here, mustache or none. 
Fine, my dear, don't say such things. If we lose our mustaches, soon all will be lost. <laughs> I think we both know the answer to that. We've got to take action. What? <laughs> you mean fighting? Isn't that a bit extreme? Well, why not? These are extreme circumstances. The Alopecians have already beaten back the Blue Army. Well, it wasn't really much of an army to begin with. Herschel, that's our first line of national defense you're talking about. Our former national defense. And even you have to admit, it was more of a gentleman's club than an actual army. <laughs> you mean? I mean. The Blue Army of Tricosia consisted of a bunch of middle-aged men meeting on the weekends to shoot the breeze and avoid their wives and occasionally practice with outdated sabers. Hector, they were ill-trained and unorganized to the point that the alopecians scarcely had to cross the border before the soldiers of our so-called Blue Army threw up their white flags and the Reds declared sovereignty over our country. Well, there you have it. What? All the more reason why we need to fight. We can no longer tolerate the alopecian menace taking root here in Tricosia. We cannot tolerate the Reds and their regulations. If the Blue Army isn't there to stand up for us, we'll just have to fight for ourselves. Plus, I may have already assaulted a Red soldier. <laughs> <laughs> so we may need to be ready for a fight anyway. <laughs> why do you always do this? What? Ever since we were kids, it's always been the same thing. You're never backing down, never accepting changes to the routine. Hey, come on now, first you're criticizing the army for backing down, and now you're criticizing me for not backing down? Make up your mind. I'm just saying, if that's the way things are, I mean, if the Blue Army represents a cross-section of Tricosi as a whole, then maybe we actually deserve to get conquered. Uh, maybe <laughs> we were just asking for it. We should just give up. Just roll over and play dead. No, it just seems... Just what? It just seems improbable that the two of us could do anything to stand up to the alopecians. Maybe we should think of something else. You know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe we should give <coughs> up. But I ask you, would you really prefer the alternative? Do you really want to shave? <laughs> well, of course not. Why, it's against our ways. After all, my father had a mustache, and his father, and his father. You see, that is why we must fight. Remember what we learned in Stash Scouts? That <laughs> <laughs> uh, children are untrustworthy because they can't yet grow mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> that women are untrustworthy because they can't yet grow mustaches. Well, I'm talking about the Stash Scouts swear. Oh, right. That. Keep a mustache on your lip and a saber on your hip. Never from this mantra stray and keep the old Tricosian way. <laughs> you see, Tricosian needs defending. Our way of life needs defending. They're one and the same. Without our mustaches, without our swords, we would no longer be Tricosian. Perhaps you are right. Huh, Chris. Let us go before the council and talk with the archstash. He knows Tricosian's <laughs> ways just as well as anyone. Maybe he can tell us where's the best path to take. Indeed, the archstash is wise. But I hope we'll know his decision soon. Like as not, the Red Army is already planning their counterattack. <coughs> <laughs> yes, glad the Red General, not too far away, sat awaiting the Red Scout's report for the day. Smug in his power, Glatt hoped for good news, but his policy change had received rave reviews. Now the scout who got Goring grabbed had made his way back to the camp to report. Glatt can plan his attack. General Glatt, sir, we have delivered news of the latest ordinances to the districts of Tricoja. Herein, you would find a more detailed report. Ah, yes. Well done. Now tell me, the people of Tricosia, how did they take the news? What was their response? Oh, well, sir, I have no doubt that we shall prevail on our efforts in time. Our cause is the just cause, and soon the Tricosians will come to see that. Hmm. Good. Perhaps at last we stand on the brink of eliminating this mustache menace once 
and for all. Uh, but... But? Well, sir, in the interest of full disclosure, I must state that uh, while the Triclosians may come to see the rightness of our cause in time, as yet uh, there seems to be a certain resistance to our demands. Resistance? Organized resistance? Oh, hardly, sir. I believe that even those who harbor thoughts of resistance realize the futility of standing against <coughs> our army. And yet... And yet? And yet? Well, there was one individual who expressed explicit hostility towards the new changes, particularly the shaving of mustaches. Do you believe his threats were genuine? Yes, sir. He showed a real gripping conviction. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. I see. And what was this man's name? A Hector Schnurbart, sir, a resident of Sector 4. Oh. Sector 4. Here we are. Subaru Schnecktiki. Ah, Hector Schnurbart. 34 years of age, a wife and one daughter, member of the Stash Scouts in his youth, received exemplary marks in swordsmanship and advanced mustachery. <laughs> Interesting. Sir? You are dismissed. But keep your ear to the ground. This Schnurbart fellow might be troubled. Yes, sir. <coughs> George? Hey, George, come over here. You call, Father. George, my boy, I have something to say to you. Our conquest of this backwards country is nearly complete. Soon, what was once Tricogia will be a, a thriving, modern region to rival the splendor of the rest of our nation. Just think, son. Someday, instead of all this forest, a, a bustling city may stand here. Glatopolis, they'll call it. It's the dawning of a new age. Why did you? <laughs> I brought you to see the progress of work. real men doing real work to build the modern world. We are bringers of civilization, and we will liberate Trichogia from the outdated squalor its inhabitants insist on perpetuating. But there are those who stand in our way. Yesterday I dispatched our latest batch of edicts, and I have just received news that one man, one Hector Schnurbard, reacted violently to the news. He has expressed a willingness to rebel against alopecian authority. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was my reaction as well. <laughs> well, is he a threat? Good question. Let me tell you something about Trichogians, George, my boy. Trichogian weaponry, like so much of the rest of their culture, is backwards, behind the times, practically archaic. In fact, the the Trichogian arsenal consists almost entirely of swords and other short-range bladed weapons. You follow? So far, yes. Good, good. Now, let me tell you about the Alopecian arsenal. Like so much of our culture, our weaponry is effective, efficient, and technologically cutting edge. In fact, the Red Army has developed a variety of firearms capable of considerable damage at a long range. Now, compare our arsenal with that of the Trichogians. Um, ours is better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ours is better. Our weaponry is superior to the Trichogians. <laughs> in every way. In fact, any attempt at rebellion <laughs> Mr. Schnurbart may muster is likely to lead only to ruin. Nevertheless, in the event of a rebellion, it would be good for alopecian forces to present a unified face to stand strong against the rebels. Okay, what does this have to do with me? The mustache, George. Oh, it's gotta go. So that's what this is really about? My mustache? Now, to be fair, that can hardly be considered a real mustache. <laughs> yeah. Don't make shaving to be such a big ordeal. Just take a seat in the camp barber's chair, and soon your face will be as smooth as your old man's. <laughs> you have two choices, young man. You can shave and help me build a world. You can remain in your present bewhiskered state and be banished from that world, living in exile with your nose neighbor as your only neighbor. <laughs> it's time for drill. Come along, George, my boy, and I'll show you the weapons with which we'll quench this so-called rebellion. Meanwhile, our heroes were paying a call on the Archstash, who
who dwelled in the ancestral hall of Tricosian nobility, and sat day by day, thinking wise thoughts and deep things to say. The oldest of old and the wisest of wise, it was said you'd see truth if you looked in his eyes. Peter Schnurbach and Sue Strainer told of their plight, in hopes that the archstash might lead them aright. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 